أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين ولا عاقبة المتقين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على عبدك ورسولك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم على آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا الحمد لله it's so good to see the masjid so full تبارك الله سبحان الله typically the first we would restart after Hajj and obviously that now is in limbo but we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to facilitate it for all of those who made the sincere intention Allahumma ameen but one of my main reasons for wanting to start it after Ramadan was so that we could keep the masjid full and so it's beautiful to see the masjid full Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen and I hope we can keep it that way uh, ta'ala with that being said uh, tonight is going to be a little bit different as I said before we started and how we cover the Sahabi today. So we covered Umm Sulaim radiallahu ta'ala anha and we covered Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Today we're going to get into the aunts and uncles of Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu and then stop at specifically the story of Umm Haram bint Milhan radiallahu ta'ala anha. Why? Because when we started this season of the first, we talked about the qualities of the Ansar. And this quality of selflessness is a special quality that you find amongst them. And then you start to find that amongst the sub-tribes and amongst the families, you have these qualities that become dominant amongst that small group of people. And so when you look at the family of Anas anhu, you see this love for the Prophet wasallam. that is of course a trait of the Ansar, but it's a different type of love. It's, it, it's extra. It's, Ya Rasulullah, we always want to be by your side, we always want to sacrifice for you. And what ends up happening with the aunts and uncles and the cousins of Anas is that you have this environment of everyone that makes this promise that one day I'm going to serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the maximum capacity and I want Allah to accept from me. So the common theme for all of them is Ya Allah, accept. It's sincere intention, sidqun niya. Sincere intentions, and I hope you see that inshallah through this. We talked about Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and I still can't wrap my mind around the man who got to see the Prophet sallallahu in his dreams every single night for over 80 years. That's sidq niyyah that's the truthful intention. And then to be buried with the relics of the Prophet sallallahu and to be the answer to the dua of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And the dua of the Prophet sallallahu was response to sidq niyyah a, a, a sincere intention from Umm Sulaim when she said, Pray for my son, Anas. And the Prophet ﷺ prayed for Anas and all of the du'as got accepted. The sincere intention for Umm Sulaim with the child that would come from her and Abu Talha, her son Abdullah, and Anas anhu saying that that son that was born after they suffered from the death of, uh, of Umair, that son produced Hifaz of Qur'an that became a legacy for Umm Sulaim radiallahu ta'ala anha and Abu Talha. The, the sidq niyyah, the truthfulness of Abu Talha, when he heard the ayah, the verse, لَن تَنَالُوا الْبِرَّ حَتَّى تُنْفِقُوا مِمَّا تُحِبُّونَ You will not achieve righteousness until you spend from what you love. And the immediate response to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rasulullah, here is Bayruha, here's the best garden in Medina. I thought of the thing that I love most to give for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we're going to go through the aunts and uncles inshallah ta'ala for a moment because that's the story of each and every single one of these people. And I want us to look at the paternal side first and we're going to start actually with the aunt. So if you remember we said that Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu and I don't think it's coming up just yet but hopefully they'll figure it out inshallah. If you remember with Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu you see it now, right? Anas's immediate father, Malik ibn Nadir did not become Muslim and in fact had an opportunity to accept Islam with his wife Umm Sulaim and his son Anas but instead died as a disbeliever and away from al Madina. and we don't even know where exactly he's buried. But his siblings actually accepted Islam. So the paternal aunts and uncles of Anas actually did accept Islam and you have a story with practically each one of them and you see Al-Rubayyi' Al-Rubayyi' bint Al-Nadr radiallahu ta'ala anha and I'm going to start with her inshallah ta'ala the paternal aunt of Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu Al-Rubayyi' is actually a common name amongst the Sahabiyat there's more than one Rubayyi' and subhanAllah every one of the Rubayyi' that you find somehow found themselves in the battlefield 
So if you want your daughter to be a warrior, name her Rubayya. It's going to happen. It's got to happen because if you look at Al-Isaba and Tabaqat from the Sahabiyat, the, the books that talk about these biographies, every single one of the companions named Rubayya ended up in the battlefield somehow, and she is no exception. So Anas anhu narrates about Rubayya that she was the mother of um, uh, Al-Haritha ibn Suraqa. So you'll see under her, Al-Haritha ibn Suraqa. Haritha was the young man who came forth on the day of Badr and he got hit by an arrow and he died. Remember, there weren't many Muslims that died in Badr, but the Badri, subhanAllah, the, the Badri shuhada are something else. Like imagine the people that, that served in Badr, the veterans of Badr were something else. They had a rank always amongst the companions, right? But imagine the shuhada of Badr, small group of people that have this high rank with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Al-Haritha was one of them, and he was the son of Al-Rubayya, uh, the aunt of Anas. So he's the first cousin of Anas. And Al-Rubayya was the one who came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the day of Badr. And she said about her son Al-Haritha, she said, In kana fil jannah sabart. Listen, Ya Rasulullah, I want you to tell me what happened to my son. If he's in Jannah, then I'm going to be patient. وَإِن كَانَ غَيْرُ ذَلِكِ اجْتَهَدْتُ عَلَيْهِ فِي الْبُكَاءِ And if he's not in paradise, I am going to cry and cry and cry and cry. Basically, I'm going to cry myself to death. Just keep on crying, crying, crying. I'm going to force myself to keep crying for him. So this is the aunt of Anas with his, uh, with his cousin, uh, Al-Haritha. And the Prophet ﷺ told her, have you lost your mind? Ya Umm Haritha? He said, Ya Umm Haritha, innaha jinan fil jannah. You think it's just one jannah? It is jinan, it's garden upon garden upon garden. Wa inna bnaki asab al firdaus al a'la. Your son didn't just make it to jannah. Your son entered the highest level of jannah al firdaus. She said, Alhamdulillah. And she was happy. She walked away from the battlefield of Badr, pleased. I put my son at the service of the Prophet ﷺ, and he only got to be with the Messenger ﷺ for a few months, and he died a shaheed. Then you go to, you move over to the paternal uncle, Anas ibn al-Nadr, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Anas ibn al-Nadr became Muslim later on, and he missed the Battle of Badr. And Anas ibn Malik says, Ammi alladhi summitu bihi, that my uncle who I was named after, lam yashhad ma'a Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam abadra. He missed Badr with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he used to always say, I wish I could be with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Shaqqa alayhi. So he used to constantly express sadness. I missed Badr. Like imagine these people talked about missing being by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in these dangerous moments. Like that's what they missed because that's how much they loved the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so he used to come up to the Prophet ﷺ random times. And he used to say to the Prophet ﷺ, an Badr. Ya Rasulullah, I missed Badr. Wa in arani Allah mashhadan fi ma ba'd. Ma Rasulillah. If Allah gives me another moment where I can be next to you, Ya Rasulullah, la yarani Allah ma asna. Allah will see what I will do. Can you imagine making that type of a claim with the Prophet ﷺ who receives revelation? Allah will see what I will do. Meaning Allah is going to see that sincerity come out. When I say to you, O Messenger of Allah, I wish I could serve you, I wish I could be by your side, just wait if Allah gives me another chance. And Anas ibn Malik said that it was the day of Uhud. And he said, I saw my uncle. SubhanAllah, think about this family. Anas's mom, Umm Sudayn, was standing in the back with her, with her dagger telling people, go back to the battlefield. And Anas's uncle, Anas saw his uncle, and he was too young to fight himself. Anas saw his uncle, and he was running towards Uhud when everybody else was running away. Think about the courage and the sincerity that takes. People are fleeing Uhud because presumably the battle's over. We lost, right? They came around, they got us from behind, so now it's just run for your life, literally. And he said, while everybody was running away from Uhud, he said, I saw my uncle running towards Uhud with his sword in the air saying, Wahan li rihil jannah. 
أجده دون أحد وهل يريح الجنة I can smell Jannah coming from أحد I can smell Jannah coming from أحد I can smell Jannah coming from أحد and he's the only person running in the opposite direction of everybody else you imagine that? what that sight even looks like? and this is Anas ibn Malik is seeing this from his uncle and he said that when we went to identify the martyrs of Uhud, the only person that could identify my uncle was once again Rubayyah bint al-Nadr. So subhanAllah, this woman who lost her son in Badr and has that moment with the Prophet she went scanning the bodies of Uhud and she found him and she said, Araftu akhi, I knew my brother by his fingertips. Can you imagine that? The only way I could recognize him amongst the deceased, because remember, what they did to the bodies in Uhud was they mutilated them. They wanted to, send, they wanted to demoralize the Muslims. This was a cruel army. They, they did tamthid, right? They used to crucify and mutilate and tear body parts and all types of things. So the only way that she said she recognized him was by his fingertips. This is now the uncle of Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So that's the paternal side of Anas, the uncle and aunt of Anas from the paternal side, right? Their stories of sacrifice. Then you have Abu Talha, the righteous stepfather. And we touched on Abu Talha radiallahu ta'ala anhu when it came to his life with Umm Sulaym radiallahu anha. So quick recap, as we said, when Anas's father passed away, Malik ibn Nadr, Umm Sulaym married Abu Talha, and the mahar was what? The dowry was what? You guys should know this now. Islam. You have to become Muslim if you want to marry me. That was the dowry. The best dowry in the history of Islam. You want to marry me? You got to become Muslim. And he became Muslim after some time. And obviously this became the blessed couple that surrounded the Prophet ﷺ always. And Anas anhu being amongst them. And Anas performed the nikah of Umm Sulaym, his mother, to Abu Talha. Abu Talha radiallahu ta'ala anhu was a fierce man in battle as well. So he used to always be there with the Prophet And in one narration, he overcame 20 men by himself in one battle, right? Which when you think about, you know, the primitive ways of battle that existed at the time, that's pretty spectacular, right? 20 men all by himself in the capacity of battle. In one narration, the Prophet said, the voice of Abu Talha is more frightening to Quraysh than an entire army when they just hear the voice of Abu Talha. SubhanAllah, the soft, humble man around the Prophet But once he got into the battlefield, the man was a lion, right? And he was, he was always there by the side of the Prophet and he was one of those who did not flee Uhud as well. And that was a small group of people. And he said to Rasulullah my neck instead of yours, Ya Rasulullah. I'm not going anywhere. So even when it was a small group of people that stayed with the Prophet Abu Talha was one of them. And remember, he had one son, right? After the death of Umair, he had one son with Umm Sulaym, and that was Abdullah ibn Abi Talha that was born on that blessed night. And Abdullah and Abu Talha basically lived their entire lives in battle together. Okay? So we're talking now about the half-brother of Anas and the stepfather of Anas, that they would live their entire lives fighting in battle together. And Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he says that Abu Talha continued to serve and the Khulafa wanted him to stop because he became such an old man. And he kept on saying, no, no, I want to go, I want to go, I want to go, I want to go. So he'd refuse, he'd refuse to stay put. And he'd go out with his son Abdullah in these heroic battles against the Romans, against the Persians, and, and these, these pretty, you know, severe situations. And one day, Abu Talha, uh, and he was at this point well into his 80s, he read the ayah, infiru khifafan wa thiqala, to go out, khifafan aw thiqala, uh, means light or heavy, and what the tafsir of that is in Surah Tawbah, uh, khifafan means even if you don't have much strength or wealth, Right? So you don't have strength, you don't have wealth, uh, or you know, you're light or thiqala, the other side of that, that you're burdened, right? So either khifafan, uh, young or old, thiqalan. So it's actually the opposite of what I just said, I'm sorry. Khifaf would be someone who's light, who doesn't have too many concerns. Thiqala would be things that would burden them and stop them and hold them back. So he said, jahizuni, jahizuni. He said, get me ready, get me ready. Abdullah said, come on. 
You know, like he said to his father, قَدْ غَزَوْتُ مَعْ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ وَمَعْ أَبِي بَكْرِ وَمَعْ عُمَرْ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُمَا You already fought alongside the Prophet You fought alongside Abu Bakr. You fought alongside Umar. Now you can take a break. نَحْنُ نَغْزُ عَنْكَ We're going to fight on your behalf. Please stay home. He said, جَهِزُونِي جَهِزُونِي Get me ready, get me ready. So they went out on a naval fleet and he died on the ship. So he actually never even made it to the battle. He died of natural causes on the ship. فَلَمْ يَجِدُوا لَهُ جَزِيرًا And they did not find a land to bury him, bury him in except after seven days. And they said, وَاللَّهِ لَمْ يَتَغَيَّرْ His body did not change for seven days. Seven days he laid out on the ship and nothing happened to his body. No rotting of the corpse, nothing. SubhanAllah, these are the miracles that some of the Sahaba witnessed until they found a piece of land and they buried him at sea, right? Meaning they buried him somewhere at, you know, on, on, on land, but far away from al Madina. So this is the story of Abu Talha radiallahu ta'ala anhu. As for Abdullah, he died shaheed in Persia, okay? So you're starting to see it come down. And then finally, uh, we go on to the maternal side and then we're gonna get to Umm Haram. You find uh, Zayd ibn Mulhan, who was martyred as well in the battle of Al-Jisr, also against the Persians, the famous battle of Al-Jisr. So let's get to specifically Umm Haram bint Milhan radiallahu ta'ala anha. Now, uh, as we said about Umm Sulaym, did Umm Sulaym have a son named Sulaym? No, who was Sulaym? Without looking at the chart. Who was Sulaym? Her younger brother. So both Umm Sulaym and Umm Haram were named after their younger brothers. Umm Haram is named after her younger brother Haram. Umm Sulaym is named after her younger brother Sulaym. Because they were like mothers to their siblings. They were like mothers to their siblings. So when you look at Umm Haram radiallahu ta'ala anha, she does not have a son named Haram, but uh, her younger brother is that, and so she was given that kunya, she was given the title of the mother of uh, Haram. Umm Haram bint Milhan radiallahu ta'ala anha, they all became Muslim. Now I know some of you might have been like, is his name really Haram? I went down like this rabbit hole of research, I could not figure out why his name is Haram, okay? Now obviously there is, you know, haram when we think of forbidden, but there is of course this, the sanctity, right? When the Prophet ﷺ mentions that uh, when he's talking to the Kaaba, and the Prophet ﷺ says that the blood of the believer, dima'akum, a'radakum, amwalakum, haramun alaykum, kahurmati yawmikum hadha fi baladikum hadha. The Prophet ﷺ says that know that your money, your honor, your lives are forbidden, they're sacred, they're forbidden to one another, uh, just as the hurma, just as the sanctity of the Kaaba on the sacred day in the sacred month. So it could denote sanctity. The only clue that I could find as to why that name was chosen for uh, Haram ibn Milhan was that there is a great grandfather that is also named Haram ibn Zayd. So perhaps it's just passing down the name. It certainly was not a common name amongst the Arabs. The Arabs have a lot of harb and they have a lot of hind. All right, they got a lot of war and they've got a lot of India. All right, why? Why would they name Hind? Because anything that was exotic was Hind to them. All right, so Hind, you got boys named Hind, girls named Hind, lots of them. And then you've got a lot of Harbs because it was a cool thing to name your son Harb. So if you remember Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu kept on trying to name his sons Harb and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi kept on changing the name, which means war, right? And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi said, no, he's Hassan. And then he had Hussein and Ali called him Harb and the Prophet sallallahu said, no, he's Hussein. So he kept on changing the name because back then, you know, you wanted to name your son Harb because he'd be a child of war, right? Uh, so I don't know why the name was Haram. However, uh, when you look at the, the siblings there, one thing to note about Anas anhu's maternal side is that all of them became Muslim. So the entire maternal side of Anas anhu became Muslim. And as we said, and now we're going to focus on Umm Haram radiallahu ta'ala anha, she is the khala of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the maternal aunt of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Therefore, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is a mahram to her through fostering, or through, through nursing, I'm sorry, through nursing. 
So the, you know, Umm Sudaim and Umm Haram are both considered maternal aunts to the Prophet وسلم, in this regard. Umm Haram being older than her sister Umm Sudaim is especially going to be treated like an aunt to the Prophet وسلم, uh, in this regard. Now SubhanAllah, when you study this woman, Umm Haram bint Milhan, and how she starts to interact with the Prophet وسلم, and what happens to her, it's once again a story of loss. It's a story of great loss and then the great gain of the Prophet وسلم, as a result of that. So she's married initially to a man by the name of Amr ibn, Amr ibn Qais ibn Zayd, and they have two sons. By the way, I'm going to stop with this chart now. I just want you to at least get Umm Haram's part now. Two sons, Qais ibn Amr and Abdullah ibn Amr ibn Qais. So Umm Haram bint Milhan is married to Amr ibn Qais ibn Zayd, and they have two sons, Qais ibn Amr and Abdullah ibn, uh, ibn Amr ibn Qais. So when she first becomes Muslim, her husband and her son join as well pretty early on. So unlike Umm Sulaim, her husband actually became Muslim pretty quickly. Okay? So she embraces Islam with her husband, with her son, and then she has another son that's born soon after in Islam in the name of Abdullah. So Abdullah is a baby, uh, Qais is a teenager and becomes a Muslim, and Amr, her husband, becomes Muslim as well. So SubhanAllah, as soon as they became Muslim, both of them became from the Ansar that fought in Badr, the husband and the son. So Amr ibn Qais anhu and Qais ibn Amr both fight in the battle of Badr and become veterans of Badr. But she is tested with something very unique. Very few people were tested with this. Both her husband and her son died in Uhud. SubhanAllah, you just see this family, right? We already talked about the others that died in Uhud on one side. Now look at how heavy the, the, the tragedy is going to be on her side. So you have this woman that comes forth on that day. And the scene on Uhud was that the women in particular were running towards the battlefield to identify their dead. After the battle had, you know, had, had finished, they wanted to get to the battlefield and, and see who passed away. Many of them lost a father, many lost a husband, but very few lost a husband and a son. Okay? Very few father and son combinations that passed away in these battles. It's hard to find. And she's coming towards Uhud, and she's walking patiently. And she asks the men who are walking away, and everyone's crying, obviously. I mean, they're devastated. Over 70 people are laying there dead. And she said to them, Mada fa'ala zawji? Mada fa'ala zawji? What happened to my husband? What happened to my husband? What happened to my husband? So she's asking the men on their way out, what happened to my husband? What happened to my husband? What happened to my husband? And then someone stops, one of the men stops, and says, is your husband Amr ibn Qais? She says, yes. And the man responds and says, Mata shahidan. He died as a shaheed. So she puts her head down and she says, Inna lillahi wa inna She takes a moment to grieve and she keeps walking to ask now about her son. So first she asked about her husband, and now she's going to ask about her son. Now, the fact that she just responded with inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un is actually pretty extraordinary because up until that point, the practice of niyaha, which was to wail, to strike the cheeks and to scream when someone dies, was not prohibited. It was actually prohibited after Uhud. So what was common to the Arabs is that when you knew that someone passed away, I think Sheikh Yasser spoke about this uh, in one of his khatras recently, right? The na'ihat, they'd start to scream, shout, strike themselves, literally strike the cheeks and shout out, right? Shout out all sorts of poetry and it basically became a contest of mourning, right? I mean, people would shout about their relatives and how much they missed their relatives. So the fact that she responded at this juncture in Islam with, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un was actually extraordinary in and of itself. She got the news that her husband died. She then starts to stop the man. She says, Mada fa'ala ibni? Mada fa'ala ibni? What happened to my son? What happened to my son? Someone stopped and said, Is your son Qais ibn Amr? She said, Yes. And the man said that he was killed as well. 
And she said, Inna lillahi wa inna She sat down, she was saddened, she grieved, but she was patient. And actually, subhanAllah, you know, her patience was, was marked, was noticed by many of the Sahabiyat at the time, the companions at the time, that this woman carried herself despite just hearing, I mean, subhanAllah, that her husband and her son both died and now she's left with a baby boy. Despite just hearing that fresh, the way she remained composed was extraordinary, something that was noted. And subhanAllah, this is just the beginning of it. So this is her husband and her oldest son. And by the way, when, when we mention these people's stories, look, they were human, they grieved. And I want you to, to understand the, the, the society and the family, the context. And then on the other side, the paternal side of Anas, you also had grief, right? So we're now on the maternal side. Then we look at her brother, Haram ibn Milhan, her brother, as we said, her younger brother. Haram ibn Milhan, radiallahu anhu, Anas says about him that he was one of the earliest Muslims in our family, even before my aunts and uncles. So he became Muslim even before Umm Haram. He was one of the earliest Muslims and he was from the Qurra. He was from those who memorized whatever was revealed of the Qur'an to that point. He was from the reciters of the Qur'an. Anas describes his uncle, Haram ibn Milhan, who was like a son to Umm Haram, okay? Anas says he used to be from those who would study the Qur'an during the day and who would recite with it at night and he said that he was from this group of young men. I mean, subhanAllah, it gives you a vivid image. This group of young men that used to come to the masjid in the morning and they used to distribute water. And they used to bring uh, food for the, pe the poor people in the masjid. So this was like this group of really religious youth that were around the Prophet ﷺ, and the Prophet ﷺ used to love this group of people. So that was my uncle, Haram ibn Milhan, and he said that the Prophet ﷺ loved him. And he fought in Badr, and he fought in Uhud. Now this is where you get some seerah here, okay? Uhud was devastating to Medina. Every home in Medina lost someone in the battle of Uhud, right? Four months after Uhud, uh, people come to the Prophet from a najd and they tell the Prophet can you send us some of your reciters of Qur'an to teach us Qur'an? We'll become Muslim. We need some Qurra, we need some reciters of the Qur'an, some of the Hifaf to come and to teach us the Qur'an. The Prophet ﷺ was skeptical, but they gave him assurances. And they said, look, we just want to learn the religion, we want to become Muslim, can you send some people here to teach us the Qur'an? And the Prophet ﷺ is also coming off of, you know, a tragic, tragic defeat here, right? Where lot, lots of people have passed away. And the Prophet ﷺ sends them 70, of the best of the companions. 70 Qurra, 70 reciters of the Qur'an to teach this group of people in hopes that they'll become Muslim and that they'll become righteous. And this is the incident that is known as Bi'r Ma'una. Bi'r Ma'una. Bi'r Ma'una is only four months after Uhud. Bi'r Ma'una, basically, once they got there, all 70 of these men were ambushed and killed. So SubhanAllah, the same number of people that died in Uhud died in this one incident. And they were the best of the companions, right? Some of the, the reciters of the Qur'an. And when Haram was there, Haram ibn Mulhan was one of them, when Haram was killed, Haram was, was stabbed. And as Haram radiallahu ta'ala anhu was stabbed, he said, Fuztu wa Rabbil Ka'ba. I have succeeded by the Lord of the Ka'ba. Fustu wa Rabbil Kaaba. I have succeeded and the Lord, by the Lord of the Kaaba. And even the man who killed him was like, what just happened? When he was killed, he looked up and he smiled and he said, Fustu wa Rabbil Kaaba. I have succeeded by the Lord of the Kaaba. He said, what, what happened here? And what had happened was, is that a martyr sees their place in paradise from the very first strike. Just like Asiya radiallahu anha, the wife of Fir'aun. Asiya, the wife of the Pharaoh. Allah tells us when she was being killed, ضحكت, she laughed, right? She looked up, Rabbi ibn li indaka baytan fil jannah. Oh my Lord, grant me a home with you in paradise. And before anything happened to her, with the first touch of it, she saw her place in Jannah. And so, you know, Haram ibn Mulhan, as he's being killed, he looks up and he says, Fustu Rabbil Kaaba. I have succeeded by the Lord of the Kaaba. And subhanAllah, that gets back to the Prophet and it gets back to 
Um Haram radiallahu anha. So to give you the, the image of Um Haram, within a span of four months, her husband, her son, and her younger brother who was like her son, all killed. The Prophet wants to give this woman some special attention. And she is his maternal aunt. So the Prophet makes it known that you know, her idda has finished. And, and subhanAllah, her idda, her waiting period, coincides with ma'una, right? Because four months and ten days after Uhud literally coincides the incident where her brother was killed as well. And the man who comes forth to marry her, and there were many people that proposed, but the man that she accepted the proposal of was Ubadat ibn Samit radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who is by far one of my favorite companions. We're going to talk about him next week in detail, inshallah. But Ubada was a, a, you know, a, a man of great authority, a chief, a leader, noble character. Uh, he is one of those people, subhanAllah, that everything you read about him just says perfection, perfection, perfection. And he was considered of the, of the most worthy of suitors. And so when he came to marry her, and this is, of course, the treatment of the widow in Islam, when he came to marry her, it was a big deal. And she praised him. Ubadat ibn Samat is going to go on in, in life to win a lot of battles and do a lot of great things. Her description of Ubadat ibn Samat was, he treated my son like his own. Speak about the nobility of character. Her young son, Abdullah, who's going to grow up now in the house of Ubadat ibn Samat, he treated my son like his own. He raised my son like his own. Similar to how Anas anhu, was raised by Abu Talha like his own. So he treated my son like his own. Which shows you, subhanAllah, the nobility of these people was beyond something that was shown in a battlefield, but it was also at home as well. And they had one child together named Muhammad. All right? So this gives you some context now with both Umm Sulaim and Umm Haram. The Prophet وسلم, used to visit their homes frequently. He used to take naps in their homes. He used to recline against Umm Haram radiallahu ta'ala anha in a gathering sallallahu alayhi wa like a nephew with his aunt. He used to call her out in a gathering and bring her forward. And they asked the Prophet sallallahu about his closeness to Umm Sulaim and Umm Haram. The Prophet sallallahu said that this is a form of mercy and that their brother was killed with me. Their brother, like their, their family was killed with me. By the way, Sulaim also, Sulaim also dies in Uhud. I forgot to even mention that. So like the whole family, all of the, the, the men in this family have died in battle. The Prophet ﷺ wants to give that preference to them. He wants to show that special attachment to them. So Anas ta'ala anhu, he narrates, he says that دَخَلَ عَلَيْنَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ وَمَا هُوَ إِلَّا أَنَا وَأُمِّي وَالْيَتِيمُ وَأُمُّ حَرَامْ خَالَتِي He said the Prophet ﷺ once came over to our house and it was just me, my mom, my aunt Umm Haram, and an orphan. And the Prophet ﷺ said, قُومُوا فَلَا أُصَلِّيَ بِكُمْ Stand up and let's pray together. And he said, فِي غَيْرِ وَقْتِ الصَّلَاةِ This wasn't even a, a prescribed prayer. So this was just a, a voluntary prayer. The Prophet ﷺ wanted to pray with them to bless them because they loved when the Prophet ﷺ would come over that he'd pray with them. He'd eat with them, he'd pray with them. So he said, we spread out the rug and I prayed next to the Prophet ﷺ and the orphan and my aunt and my mother prayed behind us, Umm Sulaim and Umm Haram. And he said that the Prophet ﷺ would visit often. And Anas anhu has the most famous narration about Umm Haram bint Minhan in this regard. So pay attention to this narration. Anas anhu said, Rasulullah ﷺ used to visit Umm Haram frequently. And she used to cook for him. And she used to sit and she would enjoy speaking with him. And when the Prophet ﷺ sat with my mom and with my aunt, the Prophet ﷺ gave them full attention, right? So she said, this one, uh, Anas radiallahu anhu says, in this one night, Anas says, فَأَطْعَمَتْهُ وَجَلَسَتْ تَفْلِي رَأْسَهُ I love this imagery. She said that the, she fed the Prophet sallallahu and then she went and she sat behind the Prophet sallallahu and started picking at his hair. What did they used to do at the time? That's how they took out lice, right? Try to pick out lice from his hair. So think about the image of the aunt, the khala. She goes and she sits behind the Prophet sallallahu like, give me your head. 
starts looking through his hair, combing through it to see if there's any, anything in his hair, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And clearly, this aunt had a comforting touch. The Prophet ﷺ fell asleep while she was picking at his hair. So the Prophet ﷺ takes a nap, and then she, he says, Radiallahu ta'ala anhu, fanam Rasulullah sallallahu thumma staiqadha wa huwa yadhaq. The Prophet ﷺ woke up and he had this huge smile on his face. And the laughter of the Prophet ﷺ was, was a dignified laugh. He didn't used to laugh out loud, literally, right? He would, his, his laughter was, a, was, a, was this huge smile where you could see the back of his teeth, like he just saw something beautiful. And she was picking at his hair, the Prophet ﷺ wakes up from this nap and the Prophet ﷺ is smiling, and she said, ma yudhikuka ya Rasulullah, ya Rasulullah, what's making you laugh? The Prophet ﷺ said, nasun min ummati, uridu alayya, ghuzatan fi sabilillah, yarkabuna thabaja hadha al-bahr. The Prophet said that there was a group of my ummah that was shown to me just now. I just saw some of my followers. And the Prophet said that they were going out in the path of Allah and they were on ships on sea. And the Prophet said it was like people with crowns on their heads. They were like kings with crowns on their heads. Now why is that interesting? These are desert folk. They don't know the seas. They don't ride ships. They've never been on the water. They live in deserts and tents. They don't understand the water. So the Prophet ﷺ is seeing people on, on, on ship, going on sea, right? A naval army for the very first time. And the Prophet ﷺ recognizes these people. And the Prophet ﷺ was so pleased. He said they were like kings with crowns on their heads. And the Prophet ﷺ mentioned them to be a people of Jannah. This group of people is a group of people in Jannah, in Paradise. So right away, she said, Ya Rasulullah, ud'u Allah an yaj'alani minhum. She didn't think about, wait a minute, I'm going to be an old woman by the time that happens, this is some, something I can't do. She said, O Messenger of Allah, please pray that I'm amongst them. Can you make dua that I'm amongst that group of people? He didn't say to her, sorry, you're a woman, not happening. Remember, Umm Sulaim went to the pledge to take the bay'ah with the Prophet the pledge with the Prophet said, I'm not staying home, I'm going, I'm, I'm taking the pledge with the Prophet She said, Ya Rasulullah, I want to be with them. The Prophet da'a laha, he prayed for her and he said, Anti minhum, you are amongst them. And then the Prophet went to sleep and he saw another dream. And the Prophet described another group of people. She said, Ya Rasulullah, Udu'Allah anakuna minhum, can I be amongst them? The Prophet said, you're from the first group. Like, this one's a different group of people. You're from that group of people. This group of people that travel by sea, spreading the religion, and they're like kings with crowns on their heads. So you can imagine that her whole life, she's kind of gotten her mind that somehow I'm going to end up on the water. Somehow I'm going to end up on a boat. Somehow I'm going to be at sea. Because the Prophet ﷺ promised me that I would be from that group of people. So what ends up happening? Her husband, Ubadat ibn Samit radiallahu ta'ala anhu, becomes one of the great generals, as he always was. If you remember the famous story of Ubadat, Ubadat radiallahu anhu was an exceedingly black man, beautiful black man. And some of the, the Persians and the Romans with their racism, right, they saw him, they were like, that's your leader? But under both Abu Bakr and Umar, he was placed in charge of place after place after place. For a long time, in fact, uh, in Palestine, they went and resided in Palestine. And Ubadah radiallahu ta'ala anhu was in charge of them when Amr ibn As uh, moved on to, to Misr, to Egypt. Uh, Ubadah assumed that place. So she's with her husband, and they're moving to these places, place after place after place. And then what ends up happening is that, you know, when the Romans attacked, and of course, uh, when the Muslims defeated the Roman Empire, the Byzantines, they got all these ships and they didn't know what to do with them because <laughs> they don't know how to ride ships, right? And Muawiyah says to Umar ibn Khattab at the time, he says to Umar, can we, launch, can we put together a naval army from this ummah? And Umar radiallahu anhu says, too risky, I'm not doing it. So these ships are kind of docked and no one's going on these ships. And Muawiyah really wants to put people on these ships. 
right, and to activate this. Now, what makes it even more so is that Cyprus, talking about the Cyprus, in Cyprus, you have sort of a launching point for the Byzantines, for the Romans, where they just kept on sending these naval ships over and over and over again to attack the Muslims from the coast. And the Muslims are like, we fight on land, we're not going out to you. So all these attacks keep coming from Cyprus over and over and over again. So finally, in the time of Uthman ta'ala anhu, Uthman anhu gives permission to Muawiyah to assemble the first naval fleet of this ummah. And who gets placed in charge? Ubadat ibn Samat, her husband. All right? So the first army that will go out by sea is going to be led by her husband. In her mind, she's like, this is it. She tells Ubadat ibn Samat, I'm coming with you. Like, subhanAllah, the most, think about how dangerous this is. This is already battle, but I'm coming with you. I'm going to go out with you to Cyprus. And she's about 75 years old at the time. All right, I'm going to go out with you to Cyprus. Ubadah radiallahu anhu does not fight back. Says, okay, fine. You come out with me. So she goes out by sea, and they make their way to Cyprus. SubhanAllah, something very interesting. Uh, I was looking through the, the riwayat, the narrations from Umm Haram, and the only like, prominent narration from her that she gets to narrate is a narration uh, from Abu Dawood where she narrates that a person that becomes sick on, on the sea, okay, الذي يصيبه القيء, that whoever becomes sick at sea, له أجر الشهيد. Then they have the reward of a shaheed, the reward of a martyr. والغريق له أجر الشهيدين. And the one who drowns at sea has the reward of two martyrs. Meaning these people that go out for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by sea, that if a person drowns on the way, we know drowning is a form of shahada, it's a form of receiving that reward. If a person drowns, then they have the reward of two shaheeds, two martyrs. And if a person uh, becomes sick and they're not able to continue, they still have the reward of a shaheed. So this is her single narration in Sunan Abi Dawood, uh, which she narrates. Just happens to be about people that are going by sea. So she has this in her mind. So anyway, she boards the ship and obviously these ships back then, you take the horses, you take the mules, you take the animals with you, and people ride their, their horses, their camels, their mules on these ships, and then they come off of them, right? So SubhanAllah, Umm Haram radiallahu ta'ala anha gets there, and she gets on top of her horse, and when they get to Cyprus, as soon as they open the doors of the ship, she comes off of the ship on her horse, and she falls off and she dies. Right away, they said, as soon as the horse hit land, Umm Haram radiallahu ta'ala anha fell off and passed away. Under the command of her husband, Ubadat ibn Samat radiallahu ta'ala anha. I mean, think about that prophecy, sitting in her home in Medina, right, amongst Bedouin Arabs, desert Arabs, and the Prophet ﷺ has a dream while she's picking his hair and says, one day you're going to die at sea with this group of, this first group of my ummah that goes out by sea. And she literally goes out, I mean, think about Sidq al the truthfulness of that intention. At the age of 75 years old, riding a horse just falls off like, okay, this is it. Like this horse carried me to the place of my death now, the ship and the horse. And she is the only companion that is buried there, and SubhanAllah uh, was nicknamed as a result of that Shahidatul Bahr, the martyr of the sea. That is her nickname, in fact, in, in the books of, of Seer, Shahidatul Bahr, the martyr of the sea. And the scholars say the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi guaranteed Umm Sulaim Jannah, and he guaranteed Umm Haram Jannah and Shahada. Remember Umm Sulaim, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, I woke up in Jannah, and I, saw, I heard the footsteps of Bilal, and then I looked and it was Umm Sulaim. And here the Prophet ﷺ guaranteed Umm Haram, the other sister, Jannah and Shahada. And I actually want you to see if we could pull up the picture there. This is the masjid that is actually built at the spot that she died in Cyprus. Cyprus is not a Muslim country, by the way. But SubhanAllah, from that day, her grave was marked and they built this masjid right at the place of that grave. And you can go next. 
This is the actual grave of Um Haram bint Minhan radiallahu ta'ala anha. So subhanAllah, the sincerity, the truthfulness, that sidqunniya that we talk about, that, O oh, Messenger of Allah, I want this, O oh, Allah, I want this. And there's the similar theme here that you keep seeing with every single member of this family, right? This was revealed about Anas ibn Nadr and people like him. That from the believers are those who were truthful to the covenant that they made with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some of them, they have, you know, something happens right away. They say something and it happens right away. Some of them, time passes. But they maintain their commitment, they maintain their resolve. And Allah gifts these people with incredible things as a result of it. So whether it's Anas ibn Nadr radiallahu ta'ala anhu with Uhud or Umm Surayn with the bay'ah, with the, with the pledge and dedicating her son to the Prophet sallallahu and then desire to sacrifice or Umm Haram and her dream, each and every single one of these people has this story. And with Umm Haram bint Minhan radiallahu ta'ala anha, you have a woman, subhanAllah, who is literally in a league of her own, literally has this unique thing. And so the lesson to us, obviously, from all of this is that truthfulness of your intention. When you ask Allah for something, don't even worry about the how. When you ask Allah for something, just make sure you're sincere about it. Make sure the intention is sincere. Don't worry about the how. How is this possible? How is it going to happen? Remember Umar ibn Khattab when he said, I ask you for shahada in Medina. I ask you to die a martyr in Medina. And they were like, how is that possible? People die as martyrs fighting the Romans and the Persians. And he died as a martyr in the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ because he was sincere in what he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is relevant as well to everyone who wanted to go to Hajj. Make your niyyah, sidqun niyyah, have a truthful intention. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for it. Allah will write down the reward for you. Whatever you ask Allah, make sure you're sincere. And ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the ability to serve him, the ability to be accepted in that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with Umm Haram radiallahu ta'ala anha and be pleased with this blessed family. Inshallah ta'ala, next week we'll talk about her husband, Ubadat ibn Samit radiallahu ta'ala anhu in detail and we'll focus on Ubadah radiallahu ta'ala anhu. We ask Allah to be pleased with them all and to join us with them. Allahumma ameen. Inshallah ta'ala, go ahead and I'll take questions now. Sorry all, that was a lot of history. I hope I didn't lose you. Um, I know typically we take one person and stick with them, but I, I hope, inshallah ta'ala, you found it beneficial to get sort of the overview of the family, inshallah. Any questions? No questions at all? Yeah. The second part of the Prophet's dream, sallallahu alayhi wa was people that are um, fighting against the Romans, I believe penetrating a fortress. So the Prophet ﷺ saw people penetrating a fortress. So there's another group of people. Yeah, and, and he told them, Haram, stick to the first one. <laughs> yeah. No, so, the, so Cyprus was temporarily under the, the, the rule of Muslims. And in fact, uh, the Ottomans built that masjid much later on. Yeah, so it was actually built under Dawud al-Uthmaniyya, under the Ottoman Empire. I'm sure there'll be a Turkish drama about it somewhere. <laughs> Suddenly they'll show up in like Artogrul or wherever they're at right now and be like, ah, I knew about that one. What's your question? On age where like he was younger, what, 20 something? What year was it? Hmm. Like AD. All right, the young man asks, what, when was the Prophet some 20 something? Um, what year was it? So the Prophet was born in the year 570. So if my math serves me correct, it would have been in the 590s. You're welcome. Zarkallah khair. Yes, sister, back. Um, so whenever I hear stories like this, I wonder, so clearly there's other ways to be a shaheed. What are all of the ways? All right, so what are all of the ways to be a shaheed? Um, 
So I, I, I spoke about this in, uh, in, there's an episode in For Those Left Behind, uh, the series For Those Left Behind, where I kind of go through the different causes. But when you look at the different hadith, so the Prophet ﷺ mentions drowning, he mentions uh, a fire, he mentions وسلم, a stomach illness, he mentions sahib al hadam, a person who literally something falls on top of them, an object falls on top of them. Uh, he mentions various ways sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and basically the scholars mentioned that uh, really any, oh and of course a plague, uh, so talking about COVID, we ask Allah that everyone who, who died through this is a shaheed, Allahumma I mean, from a plague, uh, some sort of sickness. But essentially, all of the ahadith mention an untimely death or something that was, that was unique in terms of its circumstance. So like when the scholar said, sahib al hadam, okay, what's a car accident then? Like a wall doesn't fall on top of you, but you crashed into something. Isn't that also sahib al hadam? That's linguistically speaking, it, it falls under hadam. Um, so that's all of the different ways that a person would be uh, shaheed. Now, of course, the shaheed of battle is a different type of shaheed. It has its different rulings. The reward, though, is across the board. So all of these people would be shuhada if they died as a person who dies protecting their property, for example, um, protecting their family. All of that is shahada. And then ultimately, what it comes down to in terms of sidq al the truthfulness of intention, the Prophet ﷺ said that if a person is sincere in their desire to die as a martyr, they will be considered a martyr even if they die in their sleep. So if I ask Allah for shahada, then ta'ala, even if I just pass away in a very normal way, if I was sincere in that request, then I would have the reward of shahada, the reward of it, inshaAllah ta'ala. So may Allah grant us all shahada, Allahumma ameen. Any other questions? Yes. Where's your son? Where's Tristan at? Oh, all right. <laughs> Is he running around? Oh, gotta... <laughs> ah, okay, okay, okay. He's already, we're, people are already asking, like, is he going to come back? And yes, <laughs> yes. Inshallah. Go ahead. Um, Bismillah. What happened to Um Haram's other two sons, Abdullah and the one she had with her second? That's a, so, so what happened to Um Haram's other two sons? So Qais, uh, Qais passed away, as we said, in Uhud. And then she had Abdullah and Muhammad, Muhammad the son of Ubadah. So I actually don't know the answer to that. But I will get back to you next week, inshallah. Because we'll get to Ubadat ibn Samat and then we'll talk about Muhammad ibn Ubadah. So I'm not actually sure of the exact circumstances of their death. Jazakumullah khair. Thank you. Yeah. Buried with uh, the stick of uh, uh, Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But I. My understanding, at least, is if I, I don't know if I'm wrong, is that uh, when uh, you you take nothing when you when you die. Obviously, that's about wealth, but I just wanted to understand about that. Very good. So the the, the question is about Anas Allah and who's saying he wanted to be buried with the relics of the Prophet So, you know, if I want to be buried with anything else, does it count? Does it work? Uh, the relics of the Prophet ﷺ are different. Um, now, by the way, the relics of the Prophet ﷺ, or the claimed relics of the Prophet ﷺ that exist today, are almost entirely fabricated. All right? I don't want to like be that guy, but if there's a museum in Turkey that says this is the shirt of Yusuf ﷺ, and there's, this is the, uh, uh, what else they got over there? They got the staff of Musa ﷺ. I'm trying to get that thing, like I'm trying to, if I break through that window and get the staff of Musa Islam, like some serious, I could do some serious damage, you know. Um, but all this stuff that's, that's sort of laying around, uh, you got to understand that those claims are usually not authentic. There's a lot of claims that this was the Burda of the Prophet Sallallahu this was the hair of the Prophet Sallallahu this was. Now some of that may still exist uh, in, in certain places. But the relics of the Prophet Sallallahu were different. Uh, and Anas radiallahu anhu, when he asked to be buried with the actual relics of the Prophet sallallahu Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu was not doing so out of a, uh, you know, out of, uh, out of a way of escaping his own accountability or his own righteousness. It was a closeness that he had to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa And there was certainly barakah, certainly blessing in the actual relics of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa There's no doubt about that. And that's why we find even Khalid bin Urid radiallahu ta'ala anhu famously kept Hair, the hair of the Prophet ﷺ in his helmet, a piece of the hair. 
companions held on to what they had of the Prophet ﷺ in that regard. They didn't worship it. They didn't have any idolatrous you know, uh, attachment to it. But it was a closeness uh, to the Messenger ﷺ that was maintained. Umm Sulaim anha kept, of course, the hair of the Prophet ﷺ as well. Uh, you know, and, and that's something that was, that was done. Allah Alam. Jazakumullah khair. Yeah. Do I plan on talking about Khalid bin Walid radiallahu anhu and the Sahaba afterwards? Yes, at some point. Uh, it's funny because people will be like, when are you going to talk about Khalid? We're going in order, and obviously we're talking about As-Sabiqun and Awwalun, the first people that become, became Muslim. It's going to take a bit to get there, but we will get there inshallah ta'ala because they became Muslim later on. But we will get there inshallah ta'ala. I promise, don't worry. Maybe we can do like a side session before them, inshallah ta'ala. All right, anybody else? Any questions? We got some time. Yeah. Uh, I, like, I like kids' questions. Yeah. Ask me a math question. Assalamu alaikum. So, uh, the man who, the man who uh, led the ship, what was his name again? His name was Ubadah. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, About Ubadah, that guy. How, yeah. how old was he when he, uh, when he went onto that ship? Like, when he... It's a good question. He would have been in his 70s as well. Are you coming next week, inshallah? Huh? Are you coming next week? No, I'm, I'm visiting from uh, Pennsylvania. Oh, OK. Well, in Pennsylvania, watch the lecture on Obada next week, all right? Inshallah. OK. Jazakallah. Inshallah. Welcome to Dallas. All right, any other questions? Yeah. a great question. How has this history been recorded, personal conversations and things of that sort, by people that were there witnessing it? So, for example, the conversation of Umm Haram and, and the Prophet is narrated by Anas anhu. He was watching it happen. Uh, so he's narrating what he saw. So these conversations are narrated by, by people that were there. Uh, so the first-hand reports, and of course there's a process of authenticating. Generally speaking, when it comes to biographical things of this sort, we are not as um, strict in terms of accepting reports as we would be with things that have theological or uh, fiqhi implications in terms of jurisprudence. So it gives us a picture, it gives us a story, and if there's anything that requires that added clarification, then we give it, you know, if, if there's any uh, consequence or implication of that, of that sort, inshallah. All right, I'll take maybe one more from the sisters, one more from the brothers. Anyone from the sisters? All right, you had a question? Yeah, last question. Okay. Um, uh, one of the brother asked um, in regards to people being buried with items of the Prophet ﷺ. Um, there were things I was hearing for a while where people would say the most sacred place on this earth is the grave of the Prophet ﷺ due to its closeness to his body, right? It's the closest part to his body. Um, I, I know it might be slightly controversial, but I just wanted to get your like, thoughts on that. I wasn't really sure what to think of that and what the actual meaning behind it was. So what exactly is the practice that you're asking? What, what practice are you asking about the grave of the Prophet ﷺ? Um, assume like no actual practice to it, um, um, but them considering uh, them being in the, sac the most sacred place to be in is as close as possible to the actual grave itself. Yeah. There is no doubt that there is a sanctity to the place that holds the Prophet ﷺ. Um, and there is no doubt that there is a sanctity to what surrounds it by virtue of the fact that the Prophet ﷺ even said that between my house and the minbar and the pulpit is a rawda from uh, a garden from the gardens of Jannah. So there is no doubt that there is a sanctity. And, I, and anyone that has been there will tell you that they felt special. May Allah return us there over and over and over again. And of course, the sunnah is when you visit to say assalamu alaikum ya Rasulullah, to give salam to the Prophet. And the Prophet. ﷺ Response. Now, the response of the Prophet ﷺ is not dependent on proximity, meaning someone who sends salawat on the Messenger ﷺ here is the same as someone in the, in the sense of the salam counting someone who is there. Uh, but there is a special connection, there's no doubt. Obviously, you know, some people overdo it, 
Uh, but it's also an opposite extreme when it's like two seconds and like the guy in front of you is like, yeah, look, go, 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 you know, hurry up, get out of here, you know, like doesn't give you a chance to actually uh, soak in the moment. So it's found in between. Um, you know, one of, one of the precious narrations that I think about is uh, Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. When he used to walk by, he'd say, assalamu alaykum ya Rasulullah, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Then he'd say, assalamu alaykum ya Abu Bakr. Then he'd say, assalamu alaykum ya Abati. Because Umar is his father, so he had that different type of salam when he passed by. Um, so there is a closeness, there, it is special, uh, there is a tranquility. Now, the masjid was not always, the masjid expanded to include what is now the grave. The grave technically was outside of the masjid, right? But it expanded to include the grave. Uh, so that's why you find it in, that, in, in the actual spot. And by the way, for the sisters, uh, when you're in Masjid Nabawi, you're actually closer to the Prophet ﷺ than the men are in terms of the, the, the way that the Prophet ﷺ, Abu Bakr and Umar are buried. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind as well. So they're, not ver they're buried facing the Qibla, right? So the Prophet ﷺ is buried facing the Qibla, then Abu Bakr to his shoulder length, uh, and Umar anhu next to him. So, that's something to keep in mind as well, that, that you have that proximity from both sides uh, of, the, of the grave of the Prophet Jazakumullah khairan. Inshallah ta'ala, we will go ahead and stop there. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Ashadu wa la ilaha lant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu alayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. See you all next week, inshallah, for Ubadat ibn Samad radiallahu anhu.